Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming on a really horrific day. Um, your your <coughs> for knowledge uh, deserves praise. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to bring John Beckford from Britain. I met John at a conference a couple of uh, months ago, and for the last three or four years, as I have been working on systemic risk, etc., I've always wondered why didn't somebody actually come up with a map of where the infrastructure is. So you can actually trace failures, and you can look at network contagion. And then John steps up and starts showing precisely. <laughs> uh, you know, John is a, 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 he runs his own business, but he's a visiting professor in several universities in London. And again, we're just delighted to see him because he actually knows what he's talking about when he talks about uh, infrastructure risk, particularly in Britain. And with that, John. Miguel, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for coming out. It is truly horrible out there, isn't it, today? So um, all the people in England that know I've come are very impressed that I'm here at Princeton. And uh, I shall tell them there were at least 400 in the room, obviously. So no shots of the crowd, please, um, at, at the back. Um, so why infrastructure resilience matters. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what I'm going to try and do over the next 30, 35 minutes is take you through a bit of a story about where we started in the UK thinking about systemic modelling of infrastructure, notions of the infrastructure system of systems, which is a sort of language you use here, I believe, in the, in the US, where we're going with our research in the UK, which is um, quite extensive now, um, and look at what we mean by interdependency and particularly about the interaction between elements of the of the system, look at asset criticality and how we can measure and manage network resilience, which I think is sort of new space. And if we have time, we'll have a quick look at a case study of the railway, um, and then we'll work out how we might do about measuring infrastructure performance and what I call managing the mess at the end, because this is not straightforward stuff. Um, and we'll start with this, which is, why am I here today? How did I get here? <coughs> Excuse me. So we're here at Princeton, and, and I started by getting a taxi here today um, and the taxi relied on a bit of infrastructure called a transport system which in turn meant we needed a communication system to be able to order the taxi from the hotel to here. So suddenly within a couple of steps we've got a transport system and a communication system is a marvellous picture of a badly wired server room there um, to make it possible to be here today. And then of course, I had to do that to get here from the hotel. I had to get a train. And it's an electric train with a pantograph, and the pantograph requires an electrical supply, so we had to plug into a power station somewhere else. And in order to plug into the power station, which is also plugged in, by the way, you'll notice um, to the server room and to the hotel. Um, and I had to get a flight to get to the train, I had to get to Newark, and then I had to get a flight, and I had to start at Terminal 5 in London. And all of that required an oil refinery, for starters, to provide avgas for the 747, and to provide fuel for the taxi. So we've got a few more dependencies coming up here. We've got our two airports plugged into our power station infrastructure. And, of course, we had to have a control regulatory system, air traffic control, to make it all possible. And all three parts of that part of the journey depended on that. And all of that started because of an event at the Royal Society in London about two and a half months ago, where uh, Miguel was there, and he'd done the whole journey backwards. He started at Princeton and ended up at the Royal Society, and that's where we met. And when you meet like that, you find that you have things in common. So we found we had Princeton, uh, Loughborough University and University College London as institutions that are interested in thinking about and studying and understanding this stuff in the middle, the infrastructure that makes everything else we do possible. Um, so we plug those into the infrastructure. And then we have your parliament and ours exploring what's going on and wanting to understand this stuff because, frankly, they don't get re-elected if they cock it up. So it's really important they get it right. And there, sitting in the middle, we've got transport, water, waste, ICT and energy as the base level infrastructures that enable our modern societies to do what they do. OK, so far, so good. So. We have to do some systemic modelling of this. And, and so, to prove how important it is, they, you guys arranged this specially for me yesterday. Um, 
at about half past three, when I should have been well and truly through Newark Liberty International Airport, and on the train to Princeton, um, I was still stood in the queue. And I was still stood in the queue because the passport, electronic passport system failed. So for half an hour, all of the immigration guys at Newark were trying to find the old green forms that we used to fill in 20 years ago and work out where all the pens were and hand them out to the several thousand people by this time that accumulated in the queue. And you know what's going to happen. By the time they got all the green forms handed out to the first several hundred people in the queue, of course the system came back up again and we started progressing through. Now, I don't know why it failed, but I'm going to guess it wasn't an overload. I'm going to guess it was probably a bit of underinvestment. It looked a bit antique, to be honest. But you know, suddenly, our modern world stopped. Fortunately, I didn't have to be anywhere in a hurry. There are lots of trains that come to Princeton from Newark, so it wasn't a big issue. But the guy stood in front of me on the, on the plane. He'd come, from, he'd come from Italy. He'd gone to London to come to Newark, and he was waiting to get another flight to somewhere else in the, in the USA, which he'd promptly missed. And I'm guessing a number of people in that international queue missed their flights. So this stuff is really important. It's important we understand it. It's important we manage it well. It's important it delivers the things we want it to deliver to our people. So my involvement with this started in 2009 when Professor Brian Collins. Brian uh, was then Chief Scientific Advisor to a department which I think was called Burr when I first met him. Um, it's now called Bayes and I can never remember what the E stands for, but it's Business Innovation Skills. I think it might be Education. Um, and Brian asked the question, is it possible to produce a systems map of the infrastructure systems of the UK for water waste, transport, ICT and energy? And of course the answer is yes, you can produce a map of anything if you try hard enough. Um, but a couple of thoughts that go with that. Start, people started using the word analysis. We don't analyse systems, we synthesise systems. We put stuff together and try to understand the emergent properties that arise from that putting of things together, whereas our analysis tends to fragment and break things down. And second, we need to understand interaction and interdependency because they're really, really, really important. Um, so real improvement is only possible through enhancing the interactions. And that's Russ Acoff from a well-known school just up the road, Wharton School in Pennsylvania, not too far away in a book he wrote in 1981. Um, so Russ was very, very concerned that when we try to understand system, we need to understand interaction and interdependency more than we need to understand the elements of the system itself, which is quite interesting. So, Brian having asked this question, I worked with some colleagues at AEA, a, a consultancy, and we started messing about with maps. And that's probably the best description I can give of that, um, is messing, we were trying to, what are the things that we need to take account of? How do they connect to each other? How do they make sense of each other? And that was sort of spectacularly horrible and messy. Um, it was never going to quite wash in government language. Um, then we started playing again and we looked at resilience and sustainability. What causes these things to fail? What causes them to succeed? When they fail, how do we fix them? How do we get them back online in under half an hour and get rid of the queue at Newark Liberty Airport? And then, of course, inevitably, you have to start looking at the risk and failure points in the way that the system is mapped. All very interesting. Good Friday afternoon was spent by me and a whole bunch of subject matter experts playing with this stuff, but it really wasn't going to take us anywhere. So we moved on. And we moved on to this. This is a picture of the whiteboard in my office um, not terribly long ago when I took all of the maps that we'd created and I stuck them all together to get a big, big picture of everything that was going on. So when we look on the left-hand side, we've got ICT, uh, then we've got water, we've got energy, we've got transport, and we've got waste at this end. If I think I've got those right, we might be wasting water in the wrong order. Um, they're quite complex. We looked at three levels of consideration, energy and transport needed for, because when you break down transport, you find you've got air transport, water transport, land transport. When you break down energy, you've got gas, you've got nuclear, you've got renewables, you've got coal, you've got all sorts of things going on with energy. So three levels of consideration just wasn't enough. Top level is looking at policy. What does ownership look like? What does governance look like? How do we direct it? How do we regulate it? When we look at the infrastructure itself, the bit in the middle, that's about the supply and delivery of the service rather than about its ownership. And when we look at demand, we're looking at industrial, commercial and domestic users. 
and we mapped 67 potential interactions at the first level between those gross systems, between those five systems. 67 interactions that have to work all of the time, in real time, in order for our modern societies to do the things that they do. And when it goes wrong, and it does, it gets awkward and difficult. You imagine how many more interactions there are as you start to go down through the levels that makes it possible for us to be here this afternoon, for us to send and receive all the emails that we receive and all that sort of stuff. Breaking those out a little bit more, this is the policy and standards level of the ICT world. And you can see we'll have to work and point at this point. The top level, right up there, because the pointer doesn't work, um, we've got the Northern Ireland Assembly, we've got the Welsh Assembly Government, we've got the EU Government for at least another 12 months or so, um, we've got the UK Government, Scottish Parliament, and in ICT world we have to take account also of the US Government. Yeah. ICT is a global set of activities, not a national set of activities. So when we start to think about policy, we have to think about it internationally. Over on this side, we've got human rights. There's an interesting thought, isn't it? You would have thought human rights had anything to do with ICT. We've got the behaviour of the global economy. We've got environmental change. We've got things around the capital cycle, what's going on with money. In the middle, we've got more stuff around conventions and treaties. And on the right-hand side, more of the regulatory activity. Ofcom is the, is the UK regulator. We've got competition policy. We've got international standards. Inter it goes on and on and on. And if we want to change some aspect of what's going on with ICT, we need to be at the very least aware of all of those things. And then when we look at the infrastructure itself. You wonder sometimes why your router fails at home or something goes wrong. You know, somewhere in the middle of all that is the incipient failure of whatever bit of kit it is we happen to be using at any given time moment because if the connectivity fails within the system or one of the interactions with external things fail it will fall over critical ones for me for example here might be satellites really really important you guys i think own most of the communication satellites um, on the left hand side we've got things to do with finance and money for the system we've got the ownership question i think yours is all private most of ours is now private or privatized we've got different mechanisms for producing outputs to provide to the users. And somewhere down here, we've got the users themselves and the bits of kit that they have. And we've got, so we've got defense, we've got education, we've got policing and security, we've got health, local government, we've got private users, domestic consumers. The thing is actually immense. If you sat down and said, let's design it from scratch, you wouldn't. Because you'd look at the cost of doing it, you think that's mad, nobody could ever do that. So, that's where we started, and that was 2009-10. Where that led, <coughs> in the short term, was to this. The, the Council for Science and Technology is the Prime Minister's scientific engineering think tank in the United Kingdom. It gets tasked with interesting questions that the Prime Minister of the day chooses to ask. And he then asked, at that stage, about what's our national infrastructure like? That fed into the budget at the time. It fed into the engineering and interdependency expert, expert group that we created not long afterwards to what we now have as a national infrastructure plan, a national infrastructure commission charged with delivering the plan, to research projects, the first of which have finished. So ICIF was the one that Brian led at UCL. I build is, I think, based at Leeds and ITRC at Oxford. All looking at different aspects of the work that was going on. And we now have UCRIC. The United Kingdom, I'll get this right, United Kingdom Collaboratorium for Research into Infrastructure and Cities. This is the first ultra-large scale research project in the civil world for the UK, um, which is sort of comparable with the old-fashioned defence industry stuff like DARPA. So this is 14 universities spending at the moment about £320 million or thereabouts building laboratories in which they will study different aspects of infrastructure engineering for the future. It'll be about you know, reducing carbon, it'll be about increasing resilience, it'll be about lowering cost. Um, there will be a coordinating hub which will try and synthesise, back to that word again, all of the research activities undertaken by individual researchers and research groups who generate outputs and synthesising those outputs into societal level outcomes. So when we do all this good engineering, what does that mean for society and how will society exploit it, benefit from it? 
and we'll have a knowledge hub. We are planning to build a system for, if you like, mechanizing, automating the sharing of the learning. So the results of the outputs of the research activity will be fed into an artificial intelligence engine at Loughborough, and that will help us to understand what's been achieved, what's yet to be achieved, and how those things are being converted. And those are sort of big, ambitious things to try and do. But we recognize that if we don't do it, then we continue to do individual localized research, solving localized or relatively localized problems, which might be interesting for the research and might it, and very often will be very useful in their own right, but will not be brought together at a national level and realize their real value. So, what's the problem with all this? Because this is big. For the last 50 years or so, as I say, since the end of the Second World War, really, there's been a transfer of spending from infrastructure spending to societal spending. So we've underinvested, perhaps, over the last 50 years and benefited hugely from the historic investments. Most of our infrastructure in the UK is near capacity, and we have to find different ways of managing it. Again, we couldn't afford to build it from scratch now. Some of the ways we've done things are no longer relevant or perhaps no longer work at all. Um, there might be limits to what we can do with what we've got, how much more we can use it. And there's an increasing risk of systemic chaos and disruption with wider impacts from things falling over. So you imagine if you, you take yesterday's incident at Newark, um, and I know you have lots of flights from lots of other places, but if you, your passport controls at capacity, suddenly somebody's saying, can we divert inbound international flights to other airports in North America? because Newark is full temporarily. We do that in the UK quite a lot when Heathrow gets full, when it snows or whatever. And to, you know, Claire was very kindly taking me around, giving me a quick guided tour of the university earlier, and I giggled quite a bit because it was talking about this old building that had been there nearly 10 years. Um, we have aging infrastructure. London Underground is 153 years old. Our first tube train ran 153 years ago. Yeah. The London sewers, 1860 to 1875, there or thereabouts designed for a city with a population of a million now handling thick end of 10 million. Well, guess what? We need to invest because there's a lot of stuff to move around down there. We've got problems with congestion. Our cities are beyond their, I say, design capacity. They would have designed in the first place. Uh, and our resilience becomes questionable. We have potential for systemic cascade failure rooted in increasing, often unrecognised interdependence, especially on ICT. The extent to which we now rely on this ICT stuff without ever understanding it, how it works, how it fits together, and what the vulnerabilities are, is quite frightening. Um, December 2010, 400 infrastructure impairments, that means bits of infrastructure noticed at the national level falling over. Not just your local stuff, but actually significant enough to be picked up and, and, and reported on a national scale. Um, the grain dryers in Northumbria is a brilliant one. Um, we have a, an electric train set that runs up the east coast from London to Edinburgh, um, and it picks up power from overhead lines. And um, in the autumn, you can't run the trains at full speed and run the grain dryers for the farmers at full speed as well, because there isn't enough electricity in the grid. So what are we doing? We're buying more electric trains. Um, snow on slip roads prevents food deliveries. Um, a food distribution depot, and there are many of them in the US, like I'm sure there are in the UK. Um, the motorway, just up the road, you could see the motorway and all the traffic's flowing freely because people have been through and they've cleared the snow. And the local authority has cleared the snow to get the kids to school and people to work. And there's this half mile stretch of road between the food distribution depot and the motorway that nobody regards as a strategic highway. So no food getting delivered into the supermarkets across the south of England because nobody was responsible for clearing that bit of road. In London, the local authorities cleared the main routes through London as they do so efficiently. And all the bus garages are about sort of 50 yards to the side, down a bit of a driveway. But they weren't the responsibility of the local authority to clear. They're still a public road, but they're not regarded as strategic routes. So the buses are stuck in the garage, 50 yards of snow, to get them out. Um, 
it would be maddening if it wasn't funny. And the failure of IT, uh, ICT, 50k fine for polluting a, a devastated river. Um, that was a lovely bit of interaction with a water company who had a, a sewer outfall like that they were supposed to manage, monitor the water quality in, and the pump that ran and, and pumped was operated from mains electricity, um, but the control system was operated on a separate electric loop. So when the control system failed and it defaulted to on, not off, the pump continued pumping polluted water out into the river and the control system wasn't telling anybody, anybody it was happening because the control is done remotely using a mobile phone signal, and I believe the mast had gone down. So the system carried on polluting the world. And here's some, yeah, some good pictures for us. 2010, it's a bridge failure at Cockermouth, where sadly a policeman lost his life. Um, floods around Gloucester, that's uh, southwest England. The overhead line failures we've talked about quite a lot, there's a lot of those. Uh, Landslip at a colliery, and uh, snow stopping the traffic in Scotland. These are, average responses to not particularly extreme weather conditions. Yeah, it was a lot of rain when it flooded. Over a period of time, it didn't drain away. Um, we've improved things a lot since then. There will be other bridge failures. It's inevitable there will be other bridge failures. There are thousands of bridges. We don't even know how many we've got, let alone where they all are or necessarily what condition they're in. Um, one of our politicians, you probably can't read that at the top. Um, the rail system's a bit of a nightmare, says senior civil servant. Well, do something about it, senior civil servant. Um, we have a peculiar railway in the UK with it, a bit of it owned and operated in effect by the state through Network Rail, um, and these train services themselves provided by privatised train operators. So there's a gap in the middle at the, at the rail head where the wheel touches the rail. There's a responsibility issue sitting in that space. And I'm pleased to say it's not just us. Uh, this is in the paper this morning. Amtrak under fire over pen derailments, where people are having to get ferries to work, apparently, because the trains are not, are not working. So there's a maintenance issue of some sort. So, where are we going? We have a pipeline of about £500 billion pounds worth of projects to deliver over the next umpteen years. It won't be overnight, obviously. Um, 728 projects and programmes from autonomous vehicles to a smart grid. We're rolling smart meters out to people's houses with varying degrees of acceptability. Um, renewable energy sources, quite a lot of that going on. There's been a bit of a shift in how we spend on that at the moment. Um, High Speed 2, you might have heard of, the new electric railway that we're going to build from London to Birmingham and beyond. Um, and the argument still ongoing about additional runway capacity uh, at either Heathrow or Gatwick yet to be decided. In amongst all that, we are dealing with the threat of climate change and the need to adapt to climate change. Now, I know there are climate change deniers dotted around all over the place. Whether or not it's our fault or not, nonetheless, there appear to be some interesting things happening with weather which are having unfortunate consequences for our infrastructure. We have in the UK largely private ownership of our infrastructure, but investment in it is massively supported by government on a common basis. And then we lay on top of all that our economic and safety regulation. Now, I want you to read that really, really carefully, because it just pleased me so much when I saw it. Can you all read it from the back? I'm pretty sure that wasn't what they intended the message to be. Um, so, Andrew Quinn at, at University of Birmingham spotted that one for us. I think it should be going the other way. So, let's talk about exploring interdependency and enhancing interactions. Enhan dependency, this depends on that, nice and simple. Interdependency, this depends on that and that depends on this. And we have geophysical, we have functional, we have interoperability, operational and economic dependencies. Some of which generate value. They are things we do because there is, a, if you like, a surplus to be made. Some of them we do because they enable other things to happen. And it could certainly be argued that water waste, ICT, energy, transport are all enabling activities at a national level that allow the other stuff to happen. And then we have the systemic interdependency, the network of networks.
The buttons work the wrong way up on this. It's me. Okay. We tend to pursue efficiency. It's where we tend to get driven. But pursuing short-run efficiency can often embed long-term effectiveness risks. Because what we do is we neglect the stuff, the big stuff, because in the short term it's expedient to not worry about it. And the classic is obviously the maintenance of the infrastructure. We'll leave it another year before we tackle it. The system availability is codependent. Either it all works or none of it works. The railway is a perfect example of that. You have to have the energy supply and the vehicles and the people and the rails and the signalling system and somebody to control the signalling system before you can actually run a train. It either all works or none of it works. One component missing stops the whole railway. Remember those? I'm sure you do. Every one of those failures can be seen as being driven by the pursuit of short run efficiency. A little bit of not my problem. Okay, so every asset, there's an asset, doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter what it does, sits at the middle of a network. It has a performance attribute, something we want it to do for us, and it's in a place with a specification, with a cost, with a maintenance regime, with a maintenance cost. And that's really sort of quite important. And it sits at the heart of a network, or two networks, its own network, what I've called my network, and not my network. So on the left-hand side, we've got some inbound dependencies. This asset can only do what it does because of the inputs it receives from its own network and the other network. And it generates outputs, of course, into not my network and my network as well. To do what it does, it has to fulfill a purpose. And that purpose is expressed usually through a business model and has to take account of at least weather and climate impacts. And I draw a separation there. Weather is what's happening today. It's raining heavily. Climate is the longer term stuff that that asset has to deal with. And of course, if that asset's going to be purposeful, then it needs to sit in a sense of what the public want it to do, because ultimately that's who matters. And that's then governed and regulated, usually back articulated through the business model. Okay, so far. So there's our poor little asset. It's a water pump. It's a switching device of some sort. That's where it's sitting. It doesn't know that, by the way, because they're all quite dumb. So what we have down here is a whole bunch of operational dependencies, and it goes wrong usually when we fail to do that, or if we buy the wrong one because the specification is wrong. Then we have internetwork operational interdependency. This is harder. This is the one where you say to somebody, so how do you manage that risk? Because there's some risk people in the room and they say, ah, yeah, well, we've dealt with that. How have you dealt with it? We've insured it. What do you mean you've insured it? Well, we buy it from Fred and Fred will compensate us if it goes wrong. Now, that's not quite the same as having it continue to work. Solving the who pays doesn't necessarily solve the who dies problem that might be associated with it. Then, of course, we have to have a strategic interdependency that sits on top of that, which deals with this business model type stuff. Says, why would you bother? And why would you bother is usually a difficult question. And then the ultimate question, the socio-political interdependency that sits right at the top. Why do we have a railway? Why do we have a network of motorways? Why do we have universities? The sorts of questions that can only be dealt with at a societal level. And that, what we decide up there, conditions what becomes possible, what becomes permissible, what becomes legal, what becomes profitable down here. So there's an interesting chain of constraint that arises from a government policy that says we will do this to the practicalities of how that plays out in our operational daily lives, which sadly we won't be able to explore in any depth today. But what we can look at is say, down here it's all about cost, it's all about efficiency, and up there it's all about effectiveness. And the value of what we do sits in effectiveness, not in efficiency. We could choose societally to say, we don't care what it costs to run a railway. We probably wouldn't, but we could. If we were using that spend to say, let's not run private cars anymore, because running an electric railway is less damaging to the environment than running all these private cars. You can construct that 
argument, quite logically, quite rationally, from an engineering and an economic point of view. It is about making some choices. Okay. But that is then going to determine what is doable here. Okay. Now, you'll love this one. This is nice and simple, this one. Um, that asset that was sat at the middle of the previous diagram, um, we need to know how important it is to us in order to keep our organisation, our world, our country running. So this asset has some supply-side vulnerabilities. Yeah, that inbound network, the process itself that we're using, and the environment it sits in. So if it's a... If it's an aerial tower and it's sitting on the side of a river exposed to high winds um, and um, the next nearest um, energy distribution point is 200 miles away, then we can assess its vulnerability in a particular way. And then we can look at the things that depend on it, the extent to which they're connected into the network. So we might have this asset as a potential single point of failure. That if that falls over, all the other stuff downstream of it also falls over. <coughs> Excuse me, so if we can map our asset in that way, we can start to ask some interesting questions like the extent to which that asset is exposed, a function of its criticality and its vulnerability. So we can start to express and explore the risk around it. We can look at the supply criticality and the process criticality. And that should be usable by us to understand how to make decisions, what decisions to make around how we manage those things, how we invest in them or not. And then we can do this. We can think about our country, this is back to your map, Miguel. We can think about our country as a network of networks. We can model the interdependencies. We can model how failure propagates across individual networks, the gas network in the UK, or the gas and electric network. So we could look at how does a failure propagate across roads and railways, depending what we decide to hit them with. We can represent it graphically because people like pictures, they're much easier than words to deal with, and that can tell us things about how our population is affected. So in this particular example, this runs on a, on a database put together by my colleague Peter Dudley. Um, in this particular case, he decided to literally blow up a gas terminal so where gas came into the, into the UK. What happens if we cause that gas terminal to stop producing gas? And we had to make a few assumptions. But this is how failure then propagates across the UK. So you could sort of say, well, you know, up there is Scotland, there aren't terribly many people, but it's a bit of an issue. If it was all, oh look, it is all red down here. When it gets red and you're in London, you've got lots and lots of people affected. Probably roughly where that red point there is, is bang in the middle of London. So suddenly, Westminster has no gas to run its heating systems with. The politicians will sit up and take notice when they get cold, um, or damp, or whatever. Six cycles of failure, six steps of failure through this. From Scotland, put the lights out in Cheltenham, which is about here. Okay? And those failures happen because things trip over. Things get overloaded and fail, and the domino effect runs through. Now, our networks at the moment are push networks. Our electrical grid generates power in big power stations and pushes it out through high-voltage networks to low-voltage networks to houses. And it does it in parallel. So if half of it falls over, the other half is sort of OK. But I've got solar panels on my roof at home, and I push electricity back to the grid. And the grid wasn't originally designed to deal with that but that's where we're going to go over the next half a generation, probably. So we have to deal, work, work out how to deal with a grid that, that, that sucks as well as blows. And that's a completely different animal from a network point of view, much more like a communications network than a traditional power network. If we can identify the affected populations, then our politicians can decide whether they care or not. That's sort of probably quite important. Um, but we can develop a sort of vulnerability and criticality index. We can understand where to put our money where to place our bets to minimise risk to the greatest part of the population or to the most exposed part of the population or some blend of the two. We know where we can fail. We know how to take mitigating action. And we know where investment will give us the most benefit. In the railways, this is the tracker case study, we applied this thinking 
to the railway in a project called Tracker, tomorrow's railway and climate change adaptation. What does the UK rail industry need to do to ensure the delivery of service to passengers and goods in the future? This work was sponsored by Network Rail and RSSB in the UK and delivered primarily by Arup, of whom I'm sure you've heard. <clears throat> so what we can say is, up to this point, we can be reasonably confident about what we think will happen to the climate in the UK over the next 30 years. So we have a sort of decision point there. After that, it could go a number of ways. In that space, we've got a very short-term, 18-month cycle of life of a timetable. These are things that are, you know, 18 months is about now in the railway. But we then have five-year control periods where the government provides funding for particularly asset management, asset investment in five-year blocks and our strategic horizon for 30 years and then beyond. And let's face it, most large-scale railway assets will have at least a 60-year, very often a 100, 120-year life. So we can adopt different ways of managing the assets from break-fix in the very short term to condition-based and time-based, given that we've got the information to manage those things because we've got more or less predictable conditions and we've got some knowledge about asset performance and some knowledge about the railway standards that we need to adhere to. By doing that, we can also take account of the external dependencies. So we run a lot of electric trains, some are third rail, some are overhead line, so they need a big electricity supply. Some are diesel trains, some are mixed, and just occasionally we still run a steam train once in a while, mainly for fun, but there are some commercial ones still out there. But we also got flood risk around the railway. Again, we've got a railway that's the thick end of 200 years old and we actually don't know what underpins some of the embankments, if anything, on which the railway runs. So there's a whole bunch of maintenance questions around that we need to be able to deal with. So we need to have a technical strategy. We need to understand what it is we're trying to achieve in the long term. We need to make sure, critical, that we have the skills and knowledge to achieve them with. A bit that often gets forgotten. And we need to feed all of that back into the standards which feed then back down into the three different maintenance strategies. When we do that, we can do this, which I quite like. We measure performance of the railway by the number of delay minutes imparted to passengers. So that's the you know, number of passengers times the number of minutes that the train is waiting because of some sort of failure. And we allocate that a cost. So if we can sort of work out what that costs, we can work out what it's worth to fix it. And the whole point of a railway is the journey. So if the journey is not complete, then the, the thing doesn't work. So what we can do is by investing appropriately in the strategy, we can reduce the number of delay minutes and increase the journey availability. At some point, the economists will be very pleased to see there's a crossover point where by investing in the asset, by maintaining it at a higher level, the reduction in delay minutes is more than outweighed by the additional revenues that we will generate by running more trains. So here is your argument for investment in your infrastructure. There is a payback. And that payback is measured directly in financial terms, but also in societal benefit, which we ought to be able to find an economic proxy for. What this means is that when we're thinking about our asset management strategy, whether it's the railway or anything else, we need to be thinking about that 30-year view. We need to be able to go, so if we spent a bit more today on that, what would the payback be? Could we take a project which is you know, due to happen here, let's say, in the second control period, and today, for whatever reason, because of the weather, because of the rain, it breaks, it falls over. I don't know what it's like here, in the UK, our tendency is to restore that to the condition it should have been in with a typical lifetime that says, actually, if it was going to, going to restore it in 2025, let's put it back so that it's fit till 2025 when we're going to restore it anyway. Whereas maybe what we ought to do is say, let's take a 30-year view of that asset in the light of contact of the climate change horizons. What ought we to do to make sure that Asset is viable for the next 30 years. So we then pull that forward into our break fix and push something else back. Because we have the information around the condition of the asset, we can look at some assets and say, we don't need to do that work now. We can do that a bit later on. So we can shuffle things around to make sure that they work better. Okay. 
If we're going to do that, we need an awful lot of information about the condition of the asset and the way that it's performing. So, being good at sums, we can assess the capability of any bit of infrastructure. We can make a formal mathematical statement about what that piece of infrastructure is expected to do for us. And we can compare that with what we actually see it doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And the gap between the two is the measure of its productivity. How much work is that asset doing relative to the amount of work it ought to be able to do? And how do we close the gap? So we can look at ways of improving operational performance. However, if we look at demand or we look at opportunity, we can say there is potential there to do more. And the gap between what we're currently doing and what we ought to be able to do is latency. It's unrealized potential of the system with which we're working. And improving that helps to realize that potential. So that means looking at the things that get in the way of performance, whether it's the maintenance strategy, whether it's the investment strategy, whether it's the passengers, doesn't really matter. And when we measure those two things against each other, we've got a measure of the performance of the whole system. That thing's called a potentiometer. Anybody, electrical engineer, will be very familiar with potentiometers. But I guess there aren't any here. Okay. So what we need to do then is take a whole bunch of measures of performance. And Miguel has seen this particular diagram before. This says, let's look at performance from a whole bunch of different actors that are involved in the system. The, the regulators, the profit margin, the customers, the employees, the processes themselves, wider society, the people who invest in the system. And let's measure it from a number of different angles. And then let's again synthesize their whole view into a measure of the performance of the whole system. And when we do that, we can compare what it does with what we said we wanted it to do, its espoused purpose, and we can measure the gap again between what we're getting and what we wanted. And that's the basis at the socio-political level for us being able to say, and we want it to do more. So each one of those blobs is, of course, a little potentiometer in its own right, just for completeness. Then we can bolt them together. So we can choose to take <coughs> excuse me, whichever dimensions of performance we've decided are important, and I've chosen here economic performance, resilience, and carbon impact. Those are three things that we're particularly concerned with on our railway. And we can join them together into a measure of overall performance, and we say limited by the worst performing element. Um, and you might say, well, what on earth does that look like? Well, we'll come to that in a minute, because I've got some sums for you just shortly coming up. Okay. Does that make sense so far? I hope it does. I don't expect you to memorise these. The slides will be available. Thayer's got them. We'll distribute them to anybody that wants them, I'm sure. When we look at an organisation, any organisation, we're interested in the extent to which it fulfils the purpose for which it exists. Now, there's a sort of teleological argument that we can have some other time over several beers, probably, um, around the notion, the notion of purposeful organisations. Today perhaps isn't the day. But within that... It has to do two things. It has to enable value, provide the infrastructure, and it has to generate value, the things that it does in order to generate its existence. And sitting in the middle of all that is this lovely stuff called information. Okay, information is what allows us to bind the organisation together. And in order for it to be managed, it's got to be able to do three things in real time simultaneously. And they are these. It's got to nurture its identity. We've got to know what the organisation is for. And when I say we, I mean whether it's the chief executive and the board, or whether it's the people that clean the floors or clean the toilets or do the other work of the organisation. It doesn't matter. They have to understand why the organisation exists, what it is that it is trying to achieve. At the same time, they have to create the future of the organisation. have to recognise that doing what it does today and what it does tomorrow it may be different things, so those have to be managed. And it has to manage its present, it has to deliver the things it's already committed to. And it has to synthesise that into a coherent whole. It's called the trialogue. This was invented by a colleague of mine, Peter Dudley, um, as part of his PhD quite a few years ago. Uh, and it's a really powerful way of thinking about the, the top end governance of organisations. When we've got all that, we can do this. We can manage the mess. 
And this is, again, a little bit complicated, but what it's effectively saying is we're not solving a problem permanently fixed and forever. We start at the left-hand side and we identify the problem we're trying to solve, the challenge, and we iterate through a series of improvement steps which are effectively pursuing the problem because the nature of the problem will change over time. So what we actually have to do is start to learn to manage our organisation quite dynamically. Okay? Down at the bottom here it says applied systems methods. And the reason it says that is every time you try and encounter a problem, it's very, very rare at the whole organisational level or whole infrastructure level that you will encounter a unidimensional um, problem that is amenable to solve, solve, being solved with a single decision. You're usually into a sort of multiple criteria, multiple complex problem situation where the best you can do is make it slightly better. And if that's what you achieve, then that's what you achieve. Okay. So apparently I've been talking for three minutes and eight seconds now. Um, so that's, broadly speaking, what I've tried to talk about in the last 40 or so minutes. I think I've, I've sort of touched on everything that's in there. Um, and this is a university and I am sort of sort of an academic. So here's some references um, to go with it all so that you can look it all up later. Um, some of them are mine and some of them are other things that I've, that I've, I've borrowed. Um, and that's me. So thank you very much indeed. Now I can have a little drink and uh, if there are any questions, please fire away, yes sir. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's, there's, a, there's another three weeks worth of material. Yes, I mean, the, the, there are, in the UK, the government carves it up, I think, into ten um, pots. So the water, waste, ICT, um, energy, transport are sort of level one. And there are five over that, which are civil administration, defence, healthcare, education and commerce that sort of sit at the next level up. And then, so you've got, this, you've, in effect, you've got 10 infrastructures. I decided today, we have reasonably limited time, that dealing with five would be enough for one day, but yes. Would it be, uh, also, when you mentioned about two levels, three levels, four levels, yeah. levels, direction, would be some of them can be injected? Like, when we have dealing with the maybe four, five levels, uh, maybe something can be neglected, or is it some of these things so important that it will be difficult to... Um, it's, it's a really interesting one. Um, any one of us can only act at a single level at any given, given time. Um, and one of the failures of organisations, typically these days, um, is that the chief executive comes along and says, yeah, move aside, Miguel, I'll show you how it's done. At which point he stopped being the chief executive and he started being Miguel. Um, so we need to really understand, Stafford Beer used the expression, the system in focus. And Stafford argued in his work that when you look at an organisation or organisational systems, you've got the system in focus, the thing that you're studying. You've got the things that the thing you're studying contains. So the behaviour of the thing you're studying constrains their behaviour. And you've got the thing that constrains the behaviour of the thing that you're looking at. So you have to start thinking about, can I make that decision? Can I make that assertion? Can I ask that question at this level of consideration? Or do I need to be acting at a different level in a different system to be able to do so? So... Um, John Dora is a, a railway engineer, and I did, wrote a paper a few years ago um, called Reimagining the Railway. And we studied the way the railway system works in the UK and concluded that um, most of the questions you might want to ask about the railway can only be answered at the level of the railway minister. Because the way the railway comes together, the rail minister is the first point at which the whole system comes together as a system. So it's no good asking questions down here about asset performance because they can only be answered by the rail minister. And then you find, um, I've been doing this stuff for about you know, eight or nine years as you can see, then you find that the half-life of a rail minister is 18 months. So they're not ever in the job long enough to get to grips with the sorts of questions that people like you and I might want to ask them. And, and not unreasonably because they're dealing with a, it's a huge complex system and, and they're never getting close enough to, to understand it. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Miguel. So one of the things that astounds me about this is, is the, the bounded rationality problem. How can, I mean, have we created systems? We, we our, our conceptual, cognition of management is still very linear and pretty simple. Yeah. Do we do we have any 
cognitive capacity to manage, to regulate, to improve, to analyze something this complicated? Oh, gosh. Um, so Fenton Robb in 1990 wrote a, book, uh, wrote a paper called um, Accounting, a Suprahuman Orthopoietic System. Um, and that the essential argument of the paper was that some systems are so large and so complex that they in effect take on a life independent of the actors that, 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 that are part of them. And he argued that accounting was so now so large and so complex that you know, humanity couldn't possibly change it, which was a bit, a bit disturbing. Um, do we have the capacity? Yes. Provided, I think, we focus on understanding the problem that we're actually trying to solve rather than trying to solve everybody else's problems. We have to stop interfering. We have to ensure that the people that we recruit and employ to do work for us are given the tools, the skills and the freedom to go and do that work for us. And that you know, if you are the chief executive, understand what powers it is you have got, what responsibilities are yours and stop interfering in those that, that are those of, of other people. So we have to distribute the problem of sol problem solving throughout the organization. So you know, the emergent, the, in this place you've got a provost or a vice chancellor or some, some, some sort of godlike creature who's no doubt paid an obscene amount of money and, and wanders across the, plant, you know, the, the planet. It's not you, is it? Um, just checking. Um, and everybody pays obeisance to the, to, to the huge power of, the, of this person. Um, Truth is, probably the only real power they've got is to decide what colour to paint their office, in truth. Um, if they were to do the job that we, we, we believe that they do, they need the brain the size of several planets. It couldn't possibly be done. So they have to trust and allow the people in the organisation to make decisions for them. But, but the problem with that is the job of the provost or the vice chancellor or whatever is to understand the system dynamics. So I can... I can resolve responsibility to my 10 line managers, whatever, and they're doing their job. But my job is to understand what the 10 line managers don't see doing, which is the system. But if I don't have the cognitive capacity to do that, what, I mean, it's... Um, so, so, so if you think of an organization as a recursive structure, right. okay, um, then embedded in the, the, in the, the sort of level one recursion that is the university as a whole might be faculties or schools or departments or whatever your next level form of, of organisation is. And the, the, so the vice chancellor, the provost, needs to sit in his or her office and sort of say, yeah, I've asked Fred to run that and I've, I've thought carefully about the performance characteristics of that unit that I think are important to me. And it doesn't matter what they are. But there's a set of performance characteristics. As long as the person appointed to do the job is delivering according to the performance characteristics, the vice chancellor or the provost shouldn't be asking any other questions. They shouldn't have to come down and know the detail of, of the individual unit. Okay, and, and I'll be quiet. <laughs> but what if you start hap what if it starts happening that in order to operate unit one, you actually have to make decisions that affect unit three? and you are paying for the success of unit one with some hidden cost to unit three. The, the example is uh, I get compensated for enrollment in my division, so I start taking enrollment away from another division. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and you can imagine that problem just 25. Yeah. So is, is it possible to have somebody who actually understands this? Um, I think it's possible to have somebody that understands that the problem exists. I think a wise leader um, as opposed to a wise manager, uh, would bring into the room then the parties to that problem and help them to understand it in order that he can get out of their way and let them solve it. In other words, he would create some form of coordinating mechanism or conversation that allows them to resolve it between them rather than him having to solve it for them. Because if he solves it for them, then he's behaving in an autocratic, dictatorial manner. Um, whereas if he allows them to solve it for themselves, they will find it may be a sort of satisfying solution, but they will find some way of working their way through the mess. Whereas if he decides for them, then inevitably he's favouring one or he's favouring the other. So he's on a hiding to nothing anyway, isn't he? Yeah. So, so is the key to all this almost satisfying as opposed to optimising? Um, I'm not sure satisfying is, you know, it, it might be the least worst thing that you can do. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Any more? Yes, sir. A young person, you must be a student. I am a student. <laughs> he's making a point that I think is very important. Um, 
majoring in systems. Shall I, shall I leave now? <laughs> Oh, gosh, um, I was, I'm reading a book called, um, what's it called? Think Like an Engineer at the moment, can't remember the, the author's name, quite interesting. Um, and he talks about modular systems um, quite a lot. Um, yes, it has been done, and yes, it can be done. The sort of systems engineering world, the INCOSI definition of system would sort of deal with that quite nicely. Um, part of the problem is, it's in the interaction is where you get the emergent properties. So we can take an aircraft and take an airframe. I came on a Boeing 777. So we'll take a Boeing 777 and we'll park it at the end of the runway at Newark and we'll wait. And it will sit there forever going nowhere. Okay? Until we take another modular system called an engine and we bolt it into the airframe and we set fire to the fuel inside it. Okay? The interaction of the airframe with the propulsion system will cause the thing with the driver to fly. Neither of those things will fly on its own. So we have to understand where modularizing causes us to lose an effect. Okay? So I'm a, I'm a father. I have, to, I have two, two sons of whom I'm inordinately proud. Um, when they were babies, I didn't really understand how they worked. You know, when you've got kids, they're, they're very small and they're squidgy and noisy and smelly usually. Um, and of course, you know, I like to take stuff apart to find out how it works. You can't do that with kids. You have to deal with the whole system. Okay? You can't easily modular. And one of the problems with medicine is that doctors modularize the system. So I deal, in, I deal with kidneys and you deal with liver and he deals with lungs and she deals with hearts. And you know, which bit of the patient am I going to work on? Well, you're always working on the whole patient. You may be dealing with a problem in a particular technical bit of it, but you've got to deal with the whole patient. It's no good, you know, the, the, uh, was it the doctors say you know, the, 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 the operation was a complete success, the patient died. Um, you know, it doesn't help. So you have to understand where modularizing adds value and where it, where it doesn't, and be really, really careful about where you draw the line. And wherever you put the boundary, I'll tell you this because you're a student, wherever you put the boundary, somebody else will always tell you which wrong. <laughs> it's inevitable. Yes, sir. Oh, hang on, let's go here first, can we? Uh, what does ICT mean? Information and Communications Technology. Oh, okay. okay, so IT, ICT. I mean, we don't say IT, ICT terribly much anymore, but the government still does. So if I work in an organization, they will have a, a, an, an IT department quite commonly, which does information technology. They do the boxes and bell wire stuff. If you dig hard enough, you'll usually find over in a different corner, there's a bunch of information analysts. And they're doing the information bit, whereas the other guys are doing the technology bit. It's really only in government circles that we still have sort of bolt ICT into, into one space now. Yes, sir. Yeah. Closeness in the location. What about if something else is different? For example, I'm looking at Indonesia. Yeah. It's very, very isolated. Many of the 17,000 islands. Yeah. Uh, and there are many of underdeveloped. Is that going to be different in terms of evaluating the system, in terms of interaction with the mayor, maybe much less? Because of the, maybe you can maybe put compartment on each. Island. Well, you can, you, can, you can certainly, I mean, with, with an island, I mean, I, I've argued that, that in, in, in the UK we have. Um, a place that is not very far from where I grew up called the Isle of Wight. The Isle of Wight is about the, physically about the same size as Singapore, the same size as Singapore was before they started reclaiming all the land in Singapore anyway. Um, and it has a railway and it has an airport and it has um, a lighting system and it has a bit of energy and all that sort of stuff. And I keep arguing that we ought to take the Isle of Wight and use it as, sort of, as a mini UK. So we want to experiment with it as a, sort of little, you know, a little sort of live lab with a live population and all the rest of it. Um, I think with the sort of land you're describing, and you could probably apply the same to, to, to the USA, where you know, quite a lot of it is, is, is empty or, or, or certainly very small populations, where you can look at it in a different way and say, um, as you move away from major conurbations, major, major population centers, should you design it differently? Should you build it differently? Should you manage it differently? And I think there's a very, very strong argument for doing that. Um, our island is very densely populated for the most part, but as Thayer and I were, were describing earlier, you, know, you get as far as Inverness in Scotland and then the whole of the, the, the highlands and islands that are above that, which is probably you know, a quarter of the UK landmass, has a population of about a quarter of a million. If you come to Birmingham in the Midlands, 
Greater Birmingham, West Midlands has a population of about 8 million in a space that's you know, 35, 40 miles across. So how you then think about designing and maintaining an infrastructure in those different places has to, I think, reflect the, the, if you like, the geophysical circumstances and the nature of the population. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, John. It was, uh, it's fascinating to, to sort of hear this real-world perspective. And um, so let me follow up on Miguel's question about bounded rationality with a uh, probably an, an even more uh, academic uh, and possibly irrelevant question. But, um, so if you think about the, when I think about infrastructure, I think about you know, the salience of problems. Yeah. So philosophically, one of, the, one of the problems with infrastructure is that uh, the benefits of it are amortized over a long period yeah. of time and over a large number of people. So at any one moment, each, each person, each voter, if you will, yeah. to, to bring it back to sort of accountability to the politicians, each voter thinks very little about the benefits yeah. they're getting. Um, and so infrastructure projects have generally pretty low discount rates yeah. because they're, you know, they'll, they have long lives and they take them a long time to fall apart. But politicians have very high discount rates, <laughs> yeah. right? So they're, they're just worried about, uh, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was, I was over in Rome and I, and I, was invited to give a talk at the NATO Defense College, and a UK military officer during the Q&A session asked, asked the, my, my talk was about uh, systemic risk, and he said that in the UK there was a, I'll take his word for it, that there was a rail disaster that happened, and the politicians, as a result, closed the entire rail system for five days. Yeah. And during those five days, the incremental traffic on the highways Created more traffic fatalities than the total number of people killed in the, in yeah. the rail accident, and and that's a, a problem I mean, of risk aversion on the politicians yeah. with, a, with a high discount rate. Um, so the question is, how when you how do you frame and communicate these types of issues both to the public and to politicians in ways that you can explain? complexity, you can explain the sort of the considerations that go into uh, managing a national infrastructure system. Uh, oh, it's easy, isn't it? You put it on the back of an envelope and just, just, just jot it down. I, mean, I think it's, it's really difficult. So, so when Brian was chief scientific advisor, um, he would, um, he would get called to the Commons quite regularly to be held to account by his minister or a group of ministers for something that was going on. Um, and yeah, there was this little, one particular one was the, the, um, the volcano in Iceland, where we sort of cancelled all the air traffic for, 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 for quite a while, um, and the arguments that went on around that. And I don't know what the, the politicians are like here, here in the US. Few of ours are engineers, very few are scientists. So you have to explain things to them in language they understand, which is either legalese, because they're, they're lawyers, or votes, because they're politicians. So explaining something to them in language they can understand very often means embracing their reality. And their reality will be about the number of votes won or lost, according to something. So um, being seen to take action, sadly, um, is, is one of the most important things. For a it's a problem, I will solve it. Um, look, I'm a hero, um, and actually we, we, I think we'd be an awful lot better off if our politicians in all countries would sometimes sit down, sort of scratch their ear and say, you know what, that's a really difficult problem, and I'm not going to try and solve it in my next five years in office, um, but what I'll do is I'll set up some stuff that might help us to solve it over time. And you could take UCRIC as an example of that where I think Brian started writing the original paper something like four years ago. Um, I think that's when he was, it was suggested that it might be a good idea. Um, it took several iterations to get that drafted and submitted and to go through all the processes of getting the money lined up. And the universities are in the middle of building the laboratories. It will be sort of five years from day one before the first laboratory is live and online. And that's the life of a whole parliament in the UK. Hmm? Um, when we were looking at the railway problem and we looked at the decision cycle, so we've got the 18 months 
Um, life of a timetable, we've got the five-year control period, we've got the sort of 30-year strategic view, we've got the um, rail strategy, which is, you know, sort of 15-year technical life. Um, then we overlaid that with the franchise lives of all the train service operators and realised that there's about three months in every 20 years where you can make a decision which is sort of free of either a constraint around something running out or a decision you know, being, being sort of forced on you by, by government. So you actually have to deal with that mess as it is, and I think hold true to the things that you believe in, explain them in the best language that you can find for the people that you're talking to, and bluntly keep battering at them until they listen. Um, you know, you get, you know, making, making a living as a consultant, um, a bit like being a professor, I guess, you spend most of your time talking to people who aren't really listening. Um, and if you believe in something, if you believe in the answer that you're generating, you have to keep thumping away at it. But you also have to listen to the people who say to you, are you sure that will work? Is that the best way? And be willing to continually go back and reflect on, on the things that you're arguing for and make sure that you are as right as you can be. Um, I met a, 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 a special advisor, our ministers have special advisors in the UK who are people that they bring in who are sort of semi-political um, and I met this guy one day and we were talking about some stuff on the railway and he said, before we go any further, John, he said, what's the headline for the minister? That's what the minister was interested in, the soundbite for the tonight's newspaper. He wasn't actually interested in solving the problem, at least his special advisor wasn't interested in solving the problem. He was interested in getting his minister a headline. So I would argue there that we have the wrong politicians. Okay. On that note, <laughs> we will stop. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. <laughs>